You were born into an age of reason, an age of science. All the sorcerers are dead, and all the spells lost to time. The jinn, if it existed, would be all there was. Imagine that. The only magical thing in a rationalist world. A vulnerable world of disbelief, where no reason would ever rescue you, nor science save you. Oh. <laughs> he would have a fine old time, wouldn't he? <laughs> Actually, when I first got the script, um, it was in a, you know, an Evil Genie script, and my first thought was, uh, an Evil Genie movie, I mean, uh, what are they going to do with this? But got a hold of uh, Peter's script and read through it, and it was actually a lot of fun. It opened in ancient Persia, had a lot of creature effects in it, and, um, and he always managed to twist the, the wish around in an interesting way, so that intrigued me, and I actually uh, thought it would be a fun project to do after I read the script. Hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. Stand by. Action! The original developing company um, came to me and said, you know, have you ever thought about writing a movie about an evil genie? And my reaction initially, I've got to admit, was the same as everybody else's might be, which was, no. Um, but they'd, they gave me hundreds, literally hundreds of Xerox sheets of research material. And uh, it was very, very interesting. A djinn once freed and used the stone to bring forth his race to our reality and overwhelm humanity. then activate it by finding the human who woke him into this world and granting him three wishes. He's not uh, some yeah. nameless, primal, boogeyman force that chases nubile teenagers around and kills them with garden implements. He's a guy that likes, that, that has an agenda. He's a guy, you know, from the Jinn's point of view, he's not a bad guy. He's just looking out for his own kind. We just happen to be the enemy. Make your wish. I suggest you do it quickly, dear. We wanted something different than Freddy, of course, and, and the character itself is a lot different than Freddy. But um, what, we went through a process of designing. I worked with this artist, John Bisson, or Darren Delwiger, who was the other storyboard artist I had on the film. And uh, we hang, hung out a lot, working on uh, a lot of different sketches, and, and wardrobe sketches, and armor, and his like fingertip things, everything. We started sketching all that out. Um, I wanted something majestic. Uh, evil but not comical and um, and that's why we kind of went with the approach of these majestic horns which originally were skulls uh, and vertebrae coming out of the bone it was like an ornamental thing and we decided to actually incorporate it as a uh, functional thing which is the the tentacles that come out rather than just have it an ornamental thing that's you know is embedded in his head like jewelry um, we went with that and we also went with the, the long ancient earlobe things and like in the old days they used to have their earlobes stretched down with like um, you know plates. It was very tribal, and uh, along with the tribal scars and everything on it, just to try to make a, a really majestic-looking creature. And uh, Andrew all obviously plays it that way as well. Very, um, and he's never physically. He's not really a physical creature. He's it's all done. The battle is done mentally in the film. So um, there's no the gin never really uh, grabs anybody and throws him through the air or you know cuts him in half or anything like that. So it's it's all done with the mind. <laughs> Let me start by saying that it's not, it's not a genie in the sense of, in the true sense of sort of rub a lamp and get your three wishes. It's, uh, it's in keeping really with the old uh, Persian mythology of what a jinn was, which was really a malevolent spirit, a sort of a trickster who had been sort of kept in a, 
in isolation for could be for thousands of years, whether it's a lamp. In this case, it's a, it's a crystal. It's a, uh, a red fire opal. Um, basically, uh, playing the character was, was a blast for me because uh, I got to do the, the special effects makeup, which is the gym, the sort of the horror face. And I also got to, uh, to play the, the sort of the human uh, alter ego of this monster. By the by, where is that tasty little sister of yours today? Actually, when, when Andrew came on, uh, he actually brought a lot to the role, um, although Peter had a lot of it in, in the writing. When he's in human form, he plays uh, Demarest, who uh, is kind of a suave, although sinister looking um, character who has to be able to pull a wish out of somebody. So he has to, um, you know, he has almost this Christopher Lee thing going on, where he's, he stares down his opponent uh, and uh, eventually solicits a wish out of him. And it's all in uh, wordplay. David Copperfield or something? How'd you do that? Old family secret. Where is Alexandra? Ah, uh, well, I'm sorry, but I don't really feel um, comfortable telling you. What would make you comfortable? Name it. Boo. <laughs> What's my limit? Your imagination. I liked very much the fact that the Demarest character is somewhat uh, more of a flirt. That there was, a, there were, there was a sort of an allowance for him to just kind of go with it and actually be a little wilder, if you can imagine, than, than, than the, uh, the masked uh, uh, sort of gin. Um, I, um, if I, I guess, in a, in a very strange way, when I, when I think of the character, I don't really separate the human from, from the gin. It, it, in a strange way, it all makes sense and is almost as if, uh, almost as if it were really an alter ego of the djinn, the, the human part. But w as looking at it, it was kind of weird for me because when I saw that character, that character was, was the antagonist. Forgive my presence. And not to the point of, uh, uh, you know, overdoing it or, or, or beating a dead horse, as they say, but just, just pure enjoyment and glee out of seeing what he could do, his powers using them. Surely you're not telling me this is all you can do. Nor all you ever have done. It certainly isn't all you've ever wished for. Tell me the truth. Don't you grow weary of this job day in and day out? Wouldn't you like to escape to a more exciting profession? What the fuck does that have to do with you? Everything. Take the chance, Johnny. Answer the question. Would you like to escape? As you wish. Houdini did it in two and a half minutes. I tried to bring the gin out through the human every every chance I got. So, so in other words, it's, it, it's really in a sense working backwards. And it wasn't uh, wasn't too hard to do that once I saw the makeup and uh, realized. I mean, once once it was fixed on, we had three stages of the gin. Uh, there was the baby stage, the fetal stage, there was the second stage, so-called second stage, and the final uh, gin stage, which uh, is that uh, horrific uh, looking makeup that took about three hours uh, every morning to put on and about an hour and a half to get off. Um, but um, I think uh, once I saw that, once I saw the makeup, looked at it in the mirror, I sort of, it, it brought things very much into focus. Spare me, child. Behold my true face. Yes, the shit just hit the fan, didn't it? I had done some prosthetic uh, makeup before, which was really basically a mask, like a, uh, uh, like a scuba gear mask, if you've ever seen one of those. Just pull it over your head and sort of glue down the edges. This had something like 12 pieces, uh, 12 different pieces, each of which sort of art articulated and was seamed into the other. Uh, one being the nose, then the sort of upper lip, and so forth, and the chin, and we would do these, uh, this part of the chin going into the eyes. And so all of it uh, uh, would articulate, but you're right, it, it would, with, with a lot of sort of over-exaggeration. I felt it was really over-exaggerating, but as it turned out, uh, upon seeing it, what, what came through the mask is really, was, was really, because I asked to see the dailies right away, and it was really quite, quite a, a, a nice revelation.
to see the first dailies and see how it worked. Well, luckily Andrew's worked in makeup before. So um, after the first couple days on set, uh, by watching himself and watching the dailies and look, watching himself in the mirror, he was able to figure out how much expression he had to uh, do underneath the makeup in order to, to manipulate. Because whatever he does underneath the makeup has to be multiplied, you know, ten times to make the outer rubber actually, uh, you know, immune to any emotion or anything. So, um, you know, after the first day or so on set, he was able to figure out exactly how how much he should, how big he should be in the makeup in order to bring it to life. Because this is an effects film and it's very important that the actors be able to pull off a lot of the things that we were doing with them. Um, Andrew, as well as everyone else, they have to, you know, uh, fake pain and uh, fake, uh, uh, you know, things aren't really there. They have to act against blue screens. Things aren't there. So the actors um, have to really, uh, you know, dig down deep and, uh, and find that, and I have to also help them with that, you know, telling them, okay, now the room is changing into something else, and you have to look around and see it, and then, you know, show fear or whatever. So, um, but everybody, you know, all the actors really uh, did a terrific job across the board. I think all the actors in the film, I pretty much got the cast I was looking to get on the film, and I think uh, Peter also was very happy with the, the actors um, portraying his words and everything. Look, how many times I gotta tell you? Hey, you left customers in there. That's not a good way to run a yeah, business. Don't tell me how to run my business. You're a fucking bum. Well, you don't tell me how to run my life. You're a fucking prick. I'll talk to anybody I want to. You don't own this fucking sidewalk. You wanna know something? I do own this fucking sidewalk. You wanna know why? Because I pay fucking taxes. Fuck you. No, fuck you! And three, two, one! Yeah, I'm not the kind of director who goes, uh, well, you know, I don't want to shoot effects in this movie because, uh, you know, it's a psychological thriller. It's not a horror film, and I'm not. I, I'm be the first to tell you this is straight out a horror film. So, and uh, and the effects are in your face, just like the rest of the film is in your face. <laughs> I'm totally happy with the effects work. I think it uh, came out terrific and the visual effects as well. And that's the other, one of the other reasons Tom Renoni was involved. I've worked with Tom for years on various films. And um, as an effects supervisor, he's come to KMB on Lord of Illusions and Brighter Reanimator and a lot of other films. So um, I brought Tom on when we uh, needed a visual effects supervisor. And he really was there, you know, keying a lot of the, uh, making sure the shots were being done right making sure that you know the uh, optical plates were um, shot correctly and all that kind of stuff. Well I was brought in to help uh, conceptualize and sort of you know bring into the film good quality visual effects for you know very uh, very difficult budget. I'd hook up with Bob every morning and we'd go through stuff, banner about ideas where there were you know like when the uh, <clears throat> the gen is Demarest in Wendy's apartment and he's holding the four stones and you know it was always sort of an impetus to have a, a morph there where he goes you know to the gin from Demarest but it's like you know we just kind of reflect on the old antics of Buster Keaton style uh, match cut editing and just sort of shoot it twice and cut on a blur and when we whip up to each uh, stage of you know Demarest and then Jen. That way we just sort of bypass an expensive morph, but yet we have a cool effect that I noticed a couple of nights ago really worked uh, people at the AMC. So, I mean, this film is like uh, really wonderful and exciting for me to have worked on because growing up, um, you know, I'm a horror fanatic and have been shooting horror pictures since I was like 11 and the whole nine yards, like everyone on, on this film because Bob brought in all of his friends and. So it's a wonderful collective communal effort of depravity that's, I think, sort of made it work. I feel pretty, <laughs> so pretty. I feel pretty and witty and fun. Hey, Howard, look down. 
Uh, one of the reasons we were able to pull off the film in such a short period of time, we had a, a relatively short period, six weeks shooting schedule, 33 days actually, and, um, and a really tight post schedule was because um, KMB Effects, my effects company, my partners Howard Berger and Greg Nicotero were involved. Greg handled second unit on the film and um, Howard keyed all the effects in the shop and, and uh, really they came through 110%. A lot of the guys in the film who work uh, at KMB actually play in the film um, wearing suits or, or getting killed in a party scene or whatever and uh, a lot of that worked out well because I was able to access those actors without without having to go through a casting call and because these guys play great in suits they love to act in suits and I got a lot of these guys stayed late after work working on their own costumes and um, and their own makeups for the show uh, so they were really into it yeah I need to get one of these made for me just for everyday use <laughs> under a t-shirt you know She's got to wake Gino up. What you need to see that we'll be shooting is a very important scene. There's a bunch of little statues that come to life. Uh, these are actually real statues with human heads on them. We, uh, this was Gino Crognoli, who's actually the Italian stone man. And Henrik, man of bronze. And he actually uh, went ahead with his arms. He waxed his arms for Bob, strictly for Bob, $35. Nine other films we've worked on together, uh, we'd go down to 101, you know, pick up uh, pr you know, pretty much a uh, seasoned derelict hitchhiking and just pretty much douse them with uh, kerosene and light them up, you know, after a little smack, you know. And pretty much it works. But the first time we, he ran up to the window, the squibs didn't go off on the window and he bounced off the window laid down on the floor, the stunt people and ran in with fire extinguishers and put him out. And then we had to do him again so that he would break through the window. We had three cameras on him. We had two cameras inside and one camera outside the window so he could do it and smash out the window in the same take. Well, on the film we had uh, simultaneous second unit running right behind first unit, picking up uh, inserts and effects shots. So um, Greg was, uh, second unit was working uh, on the Room of Lost Gods set and we were blowing up the statues for the finale of the film. So they were all rigged with primer cord and we blew each one, we had three cameras on them and everything. And um, we cleared the set out because it was gonna be a lo loud bang. So everybody went outside for coffee or whatever and uh, we set it off and blew it. I got it. There was four charges in the statue, uh, so it would blow kind of like Independence Day style, like from the top to the bottom. 
and um, the top layer is blue and particleized the foam. So when the bottom layer blew, the foam ignited. And so the set went up, the cameras were engulfed in flames and melting, and we're all like panicked running out of the room, you know, getting fire extinguishers and everything and putting it out. And uh, so uh, <laughs> it was pretty funny, but it, it was so much smoke after that, that it cleared the set for the whole day. We had to shut down for a day. But those are just a few of the, you know, unforeseen uh, things that no matter how well you plan things, there's always something that can be a little off. So you just have to be prepared to put it out <laughs> and, and uh, start anew the next day. I would never consider myself ever an actor, uh, nor do I like to act. I do like to ham it up in death sequences, though. I'd be uh, happy to work in anybody's films uh, if they want to squib me, machine gun me, you know. I'll take some bullet hits. Head was actually in my first film, Demolitionist, in one little cameo sequence where a guy comes in with a severed head. And it was actually supposed to be used in From Dust Till Dawn. I had a death scene that, was, uh, that we were going to shoot where I got my head bit off by a creature. And we never ended up shooting it. We actually shot with somebody else because I had to go away and direct uh, Demolitionist. So anyway, we had the head around and, and we had this whole idea of incorporating stuff in the room into the party chaos. And one of the things was the piano. And um, we had the, the wires whip out and, and reverse action around me and everything. And, and uh, we had a fake dummy of my head, you know, that we put the wires in and yanked it off. So um, that was fun because I got to, you know, die. You know, I think that's a fun thing to do in a film is get slaughtered. <laughs> Just a good, wholesome monster movie. God, it seems like we just started a couple of months ago, and I can't believe there's release prints uh, pounding the Universal Cineplex Odeon to gang members across L.A. It's beautiful. The moment on the, on the set, uh, the last moment uh, when I knew I was going to the trailer to take the, the latex off for the last time, and it was, it, was a, it was both a very, very happy, excited moment for me, um, but also it was a sad moment knowing that Basically, this was something, and the feeling and the vibe was something that really couldn't be revisited. This sort of was the beginning of, of the closure of the whole thing. And I, uh, at that moment, and, and, and I think everybody on the set at that moment, we thanked each other, and, uh, and I said that it was uh, one of the most unforgettable experiences that I've ever had as an actor and in my life, and that I'll never forget it. Anytime I can uh, do, make the movie look bigger, uh, than, than the budget. I mean, it's kind of the goal is to make it bigger and better than, than a lot of other stuff being done in the same budget range or the same genre. And um, that was my goal, just to, to pack as much as I could onto the screen, have, uh, make a fun ride, and uh, let, you know, I like to go to horror films and just sit there and have a good time, be scared, have a few laughs, uh, see some, of course, gore effects, because uh, a horror movie needs it. And, um, you know, uh, I, I'm very happy with the way it turned out.